Hello YouTubers, it's Gus Astacio back at it again and um, uh, really I'm kind of like doing this kind of last minute. I got a couple things that I wanted to share. I'm in the car. I know I have a little bit of a time, a little bit amount of time while I'm waiting for my passengers. So um, as, you, as you know, I'm going to be concentrating heavily on Jordan Maxwell for the next couple weeks. I'll slip in a few Watchtower stuff that I want to go ahead and talk about because Christmas is coming. <clears throat> um, I have in the video archives a whole presentation on the historicity of Christmas. And I've been in contact with a fellow YouTuber, Marvin, and he's made some comments. And I will say this. This is the things that I like, okay? I like the fact that some of you who are subscribers to Mike and Kim are now engaging in healthy discussion. Something that Mike and Kim are unwilling to do. And that is a sign of independent thinking, critical thinking. And it means that you don't go with the flow. You're not part of the crowd. And so kudos to you who are engaging me in the comments section and healthy discussion of the actual issues. And that's what I want. I want, I hope that I can prompt you to a healthy discussion, whether you agree or disagree with me about the issues. So I've brought this book up before, but some of you probably didn't see that video. And we're talking about Bart Ehrman. And I mentioned Bart Ehrman because Jordan Maxwell is a mythicist. And some of you do not understand the term mythicism and what it means. Um, some of you identify mythicism, which incorrectly so, with the idea that um, Jesus not only didn't exist, but he wasn't the one the man that was portrayed in the Bible. That is, he wasn't a miracle worker. He didn't rise from the dead. He's not the son of God or he's not God. The claims that Christians make about the historical Jesus. So this is the thing. Mythicism is not that. Mythicism is a complete denial of Jesus as a person in history. And um, Bart Ehrman like I said, he's good cop, bad cop when it comes to Christianity. Um, and he even says that in this book. And this is the book that I'm referring to. And it's a book refut refuting mythicism. In the playlist, Bart Ehrman really, really takes it to mythicists and says that they live in their own conclave. They don't live in reality because mythicists deny just really basic historical acknowledgments of Jesus as a human being, as a person. I mean, there's no denial that he did exist. There's plenty of evidence. Um, and so some of you do side with Jordan Maxwell on that, that Jesus never existed and Moses never existed. And those of you who do are really buying a bunch of Huey. And for Mike and Kim to actually let him sit there and say that and go unchallenged makes them complicit. And one of the things that Kim did was in her attempt to rebuttal Dawn in her list of things that they believed, which was true. She plucked out three and one of them was the fact that they denied that Moses and Jesus existed. Well, if you're endorsing a man who says that Moses and Jesus did not exist, then you're complicit. And as far as we know, in that interview, at least Mike is definitely complicit and down with Jordan Maxwell on Jesus and Moses never existing. And Kimmy is just there being quiet and complicit and not challenging and not doing what we should all do as ex Jehovah's Witnesses, is that if you have a question, you know, you, you have a lot of skepticism and questions about the Bible. How come you don't have the questions and skepticism about the skeptic when he's challenging what you are now silent about. I deem silence as complicitness, Kimmy. Now, 
There's a great chapter in this book by Bart Ehrman. It's called Two Key Data for the Historicity of Jesus. It's right here. And I'm just going to read a couple sections uh, where he talks about a little bit about the fact that he, he kind of is an enemy of both sides, of mythicists and Christians. And he says, as I indicated earlier once, this book gets published. I'm afraid I'll be getting it from all sides. Mythicists who appreciate the fact that I've made public the scholarly skepticism toward the historical reliability of the Bible will be upset that I don't side with them when it comes to the question of the historical Jesus. The one question they are most invested in. Conservative Christian readers will be glad that I have taken this particular stand, but will still be incensed at the other things I say about Jesus in this book. And he says, consensus scholarship is like that. It offends people on both ends of the spectrum. So once again, like I said, he, he plays good cop, bad cop. And, um, and this is, the, the bad cop is that, of course, he says the fact that Christians believe Jesus is God was a rise of legend and myth. And um, even though he doesn't pinpoint when it began, and there's a great argument for it being at the inception because Christians believe that Jesus was believed to be God at the very inception. There's a whole debate about that. We're not going to go into that right now. We're going to just deal with the fact of mythicism and Jordan Maxwell's denial that Jesus ever existed at all and Moses. Now, um, one of the arguments, one of the strong arguments for the veracity that Jesus did exist is his brother, James. And in a video I did maybe about a month ago, I talked about that, about how James is really, really strong evidence for the veracity of Jesus. Not only that, for the veracity of the resurrection account of Jesus. Because James and Mary and family are found, and you'll have, I'll have it in the description below, the link for that video that I did, and I'll have in the description below some other pertinent information related to this video. Um, so James, Mary, his mother, and all of them, uh, even though Mary encountered the angel Gabriel, they were a little bit embarrassed about Jesus. And scripture is so great at that because when you read the religious writings of other religions, is that there is no candor. There's an attempt to hide the embarrassing details of their heroes. Not so with the New Testament and the Gospels, where there's an account where James and them, you know, they have Jesus in the house and the cr crowds are coming, and they're kind of like, you know, he's a little crazy, you know. <laughs> Jesus is a little bit flipped his lid. And they're, they're actually trying to dispel this crowd, probably a fear of, of the violence that would come. And, um, and there are de denying Jesus as this great miracle worker. And, they're in, and, and it's clear that they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed. His family are embarrassed about his preaching and his work that he's done as far as healing the sick and um, whatever other things, you know, getting demons out of people. And this changes, this, especially in his brother James, changes after the resurrection. Not only does it change, but James becomes one of the leaders in the early church. And it, it just really shows you that this is a guy who goes from you know, just as Jesus, my brother, he's a little loopy. Please pay no mind to him. To saying and, and, and posing that his brother is the Messiah, the Son of God, the, the divinity in the flesh. And he pushes that. So there, there's a change, and there's a change because there is a historical 
reason for that, that there is substance to the resurrection. Now, there's a whole thing about it. Um, Lee Strobel, who was an atheist journalist for a Chicago Tribune, his the film on, is on Netflix. It's called... Um, it's called... What's it? What's the, <laughs> I can't remember. The Case for Christ. Okay. And in the, in the description below, there's a great um, him speaking about the, the film. The film, of course, he's not in it. It's, it's, um, he's not in it. They have an actor playing it, but I think it's a great film. It's really the case for Christ really from his wife's perspective, actually. So even though the book is the case for Christ, she had written a book. And the film is based not on the case for Christ book, and only in part, but mostly from his wife's perspective, who became a Christian and encountered all kinds of problems in home with her husband. So it's a great, great film to watch and check the description to listen to Lee Strobel. He is not a scholar, but now I think he's one of the foremost experts on the resurrection, as well as Gary Habermas who I think I have an interview with Gary Habermas in the archives. He's one of the world's foremost authorities on the resurrection. Anyway, so here is Ephesus' views of James. And um, Bart Ehrman mentions another scholar, probably, well, the only scholar who supports the Mythos' view, who I have in the archives also, Robert Price. But, um, so check our archives. Mythicists have long realized that the fact that Paul knew Jesus' brother creates enormous problems for their view. That, in fact, the otherwise convincing to them case against Jesus' existence is more or less sunk by the fact that Paul was acquainted with his blood relations. And so they have tried with some futility, in my view, to explain away Paul's statements so that even though he called James the brother of the Lord, he didn't really mean it in that way. The most recent attempt to resolve the problem is in mythicist Robert Price's comprehensive study, where he cites three possible explanations for how James may not actually be Jesus' brother. Price has the honesty to admit that if these explanations, quote, end up sounding like text-twisting twi harmonizations, we must so and reject we must say so and reject them, unquote. In the end, he doesn't say so, and he doesn't reject them, but he doesn't embrace any of them either, which at least must leave his readers puzzled. So it's a, it's a good book. Um, like I said, and just like he admits, Bart admits that, you know, there are things that, of course, many of you ex-Jehovah Witnesses that are skeptics are going to like about this book. And there are things that if you are holding to the mythicist view, like Jordan Maxwell and Mikey, are not going to like about this. Because there's an abundance of evidence to prove that Jesus was a real historical person. That is, he was born, he's a human being, you know. He drank wine at the wedding at Cana. And uh, so this is, that's that. Now, I do want to share something else, and I, I I do have this literature at home, but I photocopied it, and um, this has to deal with Jordan Maxwell's claim that the spirits or beings that told him that he's from the constellation of the Pleiades, which I think is one of the links that Jordan Maxwell is just regurgitating and borrowing things that he knew and learned when he was a witness and he's just reusing it, rehashing it, repackaging it. And some of you are suckers for it. And a lot of the new witnesses, the YouTube sensation is the fact that we have a lot of new escapees that are ignorant about the past of the organization. <clears throat> and the fact is that there is, there was once thought that Jehovah lived in the Pleiades constellation. It's actually from uh, this book, Reconciliation, which Judge Rutherford had published. It's a yellow book. I have it at home. 
And uh, it's on page 14, and it says, The constellation of the seven stars forming the Pleiades appears to be the crowning center around which the known systems of the planets revolve, even as... It Excuse me, as our planet, sun's planets obey the sun and travel in their respective orbits. It has been suggested and with much weight that one of the stars of that group is the dwelling place of Jehovah and the place of the highest heavens and is the place to which the inspired writer referred when he said, Hear thou from thy dwelling place, even from heaven, Second Chronicles 6.21. And that it is the place to which Job referred when under inspiration he wrote, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? The constellation of the Pleiades is a small one compared with others, which scientific instruments disclose to the wondering eyes of man. But the greatness and size of other stars or planets is small when, com when compared with the Pleiades and importance because the Pleiades is the place of the eternal throne of God. So this is what I keep referring to when I say Jordan Maxwell, the charlatan, is claiming that he's from the Pleiades. It's just throwing up new vomitous teaching. The Watchtower Society abandoned this and, uh, and the questions from readers for the Watchtower November 15th, 1953 edition. In one of the paragraphs, it's funny. Um, so the question is, what is meant by the binding sweet influence of the Pleiades or loosing the bands of Orion or bringing forth Maseroth in his seasons or guiding Arcturus with his sons as mentioned at Job 38, 31, 32? And I'm just going to read this little section to show that they've abandoned that teaching, but no, no doubt Jordan Maxwell has. It. And, he's, and he's spewing it. And he's teaching it. And some of you are just buying into it. Like Mikey. Incidentally, Pleiades can no longer be considered the center of the universe. It would be unwise for us to try to fix God's throne as being at a particular spot in the universe. Were we to think of the Pleiades as a throne we might improperly view with special veneration, that cluster of stars. So it's the November 15th, 1953 Watchtower, Jordan Maximus. Garbage. Garbage. It's, it's, it's just rehashed Watchtower stuff. All right. Now, I, I do want to take this time to thank dear friend Brenda, who I met through the comments section. And she's given me the book. I, I have the book now, but for years I just had the photocopy of it. And once again, tie in to Jordan Maxwell. I call him the demon-possessed prophet. And this is the reason why. Because there are several books and writings that sound like rehashed, regurgitated stuff by people who have encountered otherworldly beings, whether it's aliens or demons. The Urantia book is one by Clark Kellogg. I've already mentioned that before. Uh, but more notably for us ex-witnesses and the Watchtower Society, there is this guy from the Kingdom Interlinear and the uh, inspired, uh, the, the, uh, their study edition of their New World Translation, John H. Thompson. So it's in the Appendix 2A section Jesus, a godlike one, divine, John 1 1. And basically, it's a justification for John 1 1. And 1829, John H. Tom John S. Thompson, that is, has a book called The Monticeron or the Gospel History According to the Four Evangelos, Evangelists. And in there, he has, and the Logos was a God. Now, there are things about John S. Thompson that you don't know about. And he appears in the American Quarterly, Quarterly, which I have. But before we do that, we're going to take a detour to the other guy. The other known demon, demonic occultist. You know what? I'll just go ahead and show that first. All right. Here goes John S. Thompson's The American Quarterly. All right. And, and I, I have a lot. I have to thank some of the people that I have been around that have really given me 
you know, a lot of the stuff. Ray Goldsmith. Ray Goldsmith did this for me. Now, he was, this was over, well, I was 26, 27. And he, I, he was, had to have been in his 80s then. I went to visit him. He was in Virginia. Really nice guy. Super, super intelligent. This is when we used to, me, Ray Goldsmith, Robert Hamo, and Dave Sherrell used to go on a, uh, this is when the internet was just starting. I mean, I had a, it was a heavy computer with a screen about five inches, that's it, five inches wide. <clears throat> and they used, eh, eh, and he's make a lot of noise. <laughs> and the, and you would hear the wee. I mean, AOL, I think, was the, the primary internet provider back then. But um, So Ray was a guy, and he, he did this for me. And God bless him. Um, if he's still alive, God bless him. If he's not, I know that he's with the Lord. That man was just brilliant. It was great to visit him. Um, he was in a, I think it was a nursing home then. It might have been assisted living. So long. I was young. I was a kid. But Ray Ray did this for me. And I, I, I am eternally grateful. Here, you know, many, many, 22 years later, I'm still using this as a resource. So, yeah, John S. Thompson. We're going to go into the American Quarterly. It's 21 minutes in. But um, I want to share what, Brenda's, what Brenda gave to me. And she bought me this book, which I had only photocopies thanks to Ray. So two people did wonderful things for me. I'm just blessed. And this is, of course, Johannes Grieber's Communication with the Spirit World. So, and um, it's, Johannes Grieber was a Catholic priest. His wife was a witch. <laughs> and I'm not meaning that in a derogatory sense. Uh, but, um, Anyway, so the point in this is, you know, I, I, I've read Johannes Grieber and there's the, the whole point of all of these occultists and their writings is the attempt to uh, make Jesus look small, you know. Uh, and so um, here goes, uh, let's see. John H. Thompson has a really scary occurrence in his book, in his, I mean, the journal, American Quarterly. I'm looking for the spot where he talks about, uh, where he had, you know, so this is what remind really, um, when I hear, when I heard Jordan Maxwell's experience, and we're going to go through that later on. Um, it reminds me of John S. Thompson's experience in the American Quarterly. Um, he's scared. Jordan Maxwell's scared. And he um, and he tells them right away, he says, Look, I don't want you creeping, up, creeping me out at night. Um, I don't want you to go out and abduct me, things like that. He's scared. He's terrified. He, he's giving the experience and he's telling you that when he encountered this, even though he calls it beautiful, he's terrified. And um, John S. Thompson has the same, you know, fear when he's in, in, in encountering these spirits. And I'm trying to find it, but I can only tell you from what I've read. So he also finds it beautiful. He thinks it's from heaven. He thinks they're good spirits, but but he's terrified. And uh, 